Uh, so good morning. So good morning, good afternoon, and or good evening, depending upon where you are. I'm Steve Hendrick, and I'll be moderating today's discussion about understanding the role of software bill of materials in cybersecurity readiness. Now, today we've gathered together SBOM experts from the federal government and the Linux Foundation to provide insight into the growing momentum behind SBOMs and what needs to happen to ensure that this momentum persists. So I'd also like to respond, uh, remind everybody listening that the Linux Foundation has today released a survey based on uh, based uh, uh, survey based report about S bombs and cybersecurity readiness, and you can find the press release on the LF homepage, and it contains a link to the report. And I think we'll also provide a link a link today uh, so that um, to make it a little easier for you. So now I'd like to start by having each of the panelists introduce themselves and their orientation to S bombs, starting with Kate, then Jessica, and finally Alan. So Kate. Sure. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so my name is Kate Stewart. I'm a VP of Dependable Embedded Systems here at the Linux Foundation. And my perspective coming in on the SBOM side has started about 10 years ago when I was in the embedded space, trying to figure out how we could summarize the information that was available in packages so that we all weren't looking at the same package. Uh, this was the sort of the starting point of the SPDX project and um, have continued working on that. And in the last three years have been involved working closely with Alan on the NTIA efforts from there. Um, so trying to co being a co-lead on the formats and tooling working group to understand what the lie of the land looked like and how we can start to get this operationalized. Great, thanks. Jessica? Sure, uh, so I am Jessica Wilkerson. I'm a senior cyber policy advisor with the Food and Drug Administration. And for those of you who've been following along, uh, FDA has been a huge proponent of SBOM for several years. Uh, I believe it was 2017 that FDA first announced its, uh, its interest in pursuing uh, software bill materials, particularly for medical device cybersecurity. So this was coming on the heels of some cybersecurity incidents in the healthcare space, where it became very clear uh, where not knowing what uh, software packages and, and other software components may exist within a device or a healthcare environment creates huge security risk. Uh, so I am specifically thinking of WannaCry for those of you who remember uh, way back when. So FDA has been working on uh, software bill of materials uh, referred to in some cases as cybersecurity bill of materials in some of FDA's resources. Um, since that time, and we continue to do so, we, uh, you know, we contributed to Alan's process over at the NCIA uh, and continue to work um, in other forums, including with international partners on software bill materials and getting it uh, adapted and integrated into the medical device ecosystem and the healthcare ecosystem. Thank you. Okay, Alan. Uh, thank you, and, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, Alan Friedman, currently with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency in the US government. Uh, but was previously at uh, NTIA, which is part of the US Department of Commerce. And want to sort of clarify also, this is very much an international effort that just happens to be uh, sort of uh, catalyzed by the US government. Um, and indeed, that's a big part of why the US government got involved is because we wanted a solution to exist in the marketplace uh, that didn't. And we said the best way to do that is to bring together experts from across the different parts of the software world, across different sectors, uh, across different interests, across different parts of the marketplace and around the world to say, how do we make this a reality? Uh, and so first at NTIA, defining the basics and now at CISA focusing on scaling and operationalization. The vision is this, uh, what is an SBOM? How do we move it forward? Uh, and, and also make sure that we understand it as a complex system, right? It's not just a technical as aspect. It's not just an operational aspect. It's not just a, a business aspect. We need to find a way to combine those and have a shared vision that pulls together all approaches. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Alan. All right, so let's start with questions. Um, and I'm gonna begin by saying that um, when we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk about SBOMs obviously and why SBOMs are being called a cornerstone of software supply chain security. I've seen this over and over again in print and, and, and also, and why it's time to require SBOMs. Um, so I'm gonna start with a simple SBOM definition, which is that an SBOM is a nested inventory of ingredients that makes up a software component and provides vital information about the software component itself. 
So, I mean, there's a lot that's packed into that, but let's, let's look into the whole issue of what an SBOM is by talking about why SBOMs are a cornerstone of software supply chain security. And of course, part of, uh, part of this is what it is that SBOMs are doing that's so important. So um, why is it time to require the production and consumption of SBOMs? And I'm just gonna let panelists respond as they may, um, because some, some may have more to say about this than others. So, so again, why is it time to require the production and consumption of SBOMs? Alan, go for it. <laughs> you, you, you've got the most rehearsed version of this. <laughs> well, right. So, so first, the, the the cornerstone model. Like, why is this foundational? And, and okay, it's joking. I, I keep a pack of Twinkies behind me uh, <laughs> because you go to the store and you buy a nice non biodegradable treat. It comes with a list of ingredients. Why don't we expect that level of transparency? in the software that's running our businesses, our organizations, our critical infrastructure, right? That's the bare minimum. And really, you know, as a foundational cornerstone, it is just that. It is a foundation upon which we're going to build more things. So our list of ingredients analogy, it won't magically save you from allergies. It won't magically, if you have a plant-based diet, uh, keep you from accidentally eating something like that. So for example, Twinkies have tallow in them. Now, you have to know that tallow is, in fact, beef fat if you're going to take advantage of this. So it's the starting point upon which we're going to build a lot of great other products, great other services, and great other tools. Okay, anybody else want to add to that, or should we, no, should we move I, on? I'll just say that, you know, to Alan's point completely, it's, it's the transparency, and it's the summarizing in an effective fashion what is there. Okay, um, a lot of open source, all the sources available. Okay, great, yeah, fine. Or it may not be available in some cases, but you know you're using it. The challenge though is how can we get this to work at scale? And so how do we have a common language for expressing this information so the automation can really come into play? Well, the, the one thing I'd, I'd like to probe a little further on, and, and we'll probably get to this later as well, but um, so we're talking about informationally what an SBOM is. Um, and so there's obviously information in there about the license, there's information about dependencies, um, but it seems like in the last three or four years that there's been a pivot with the addition of trying to understand vulnerabilities when it comes to, when it comes to SBOMs. So, uh, so and, then it, and it doesn't feel as if anybody has, has identified that yet as being you know, one of the cornerstone reasons for why SBOMs are important. So should we, we chat a little bit about this now or, or you wanna wait until later? I think this is where Jessica's really had a good role here. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, so so there's a couple of interesting parts of this, right? So on the one part, and I, I think it's very critical, and I think Alan and Kate could even talk about this a little bit more cogently than I can. But it is incredibly important in mine and FDA's point of view that the S bomb doesn't actually contain vulnerability information. I think that that needs to be said. That you know the S bomb is, is a thing and it's a document and exists and it can be cross-referenced with vulnerability information, but the vulnerability information should not be in the SBOM. But um, I think the reason that, that Kate sort of tagged me in this one is um, the primary use case for, for FDA that we've identified is um, vulnerability response. You know, we, we have in the medical device sector and in the healthcare sector generally, all the time people will approach uh, manufacturers or the FDA and essentially say, hey, we found, you know, a vulnerability in, uh, in X product, or sometimes it's, you know, a vulnerability has been discovered in, in Y component. And we're not sitting there a lot of the times. We're like, hmm, does anybody know what medical devices contain Y component? Because we don't. And then if we don't know, we don't know how to analyze what the patient safety risks are. We don't know what manufacturers we need to be contacting to ensure that they're actually responding to the vulnerability. We can't do the things that we need to do in order to fulfill FDA statutory mission. And so for us, um, you know, SBOM is critically important just from the transparency measure. And, and uh, you know, we, we can talk about some of the other things because one of the big use cases for me is actually SBOM for procurement. Uh, but that vulnerability management is is huge. It's it's been the main driver of SBOM at FCA for a really long time. And, and to to add on to Jessica's point, that vulnerability management role really is something that follows the entire software lifecycle. So, you're writing software. 
I was part of an open source project, uh, and you're sort of saying, all right, let's 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 you know commit to this, uh, or commercially, right? why would you not want to know what down in your dependency graph? And of course, there are some tools today, uh, right? You know, GitHub flags this sort of thing for you. Um, but having that in a machine readable format that scales that everyone is using across the board is going to be very, very helpful. Um, when you're buying something, are you about to buy something that has known bad in it, right? This is the, right, would you buy something? Uh, don't you want the freshest, healthiest ingredients? Or do you, are you comfortable with something out of date? You may say I'm comfortable with that, but that should be an affirmative risk-based decision. This is the best, this is the thing that's going to save patient lives. Um, so it's okay that there's some outdated software in there because I can secure that on my network. That's a, that needs to be a conscious decision. And then lastly, and perhaps when we saw this in December, um, the world of vulnerabilities is a very dynamic world. And I think that's one of the reasons why we want to make sure that we're not sort of locking, we're mapping between SBOM and vulnerabilities rather than binding them. Um, because they used to be secure, and then one day we wake up and there's a front page headline. And now we have to scramble and find out if we're affected. Uh, and this is really hard if you don't have data that you can search through at scale, ideally with tools and automation. And so that is really one of those long-term things. Um, to, to pick an open source project at random, right? knowing where Log4j is could be very helpful. Uh, and, and that's one of the powers of this. And I think this is why we've seen a lot of excitement around SBOM. Uh, in the highest levels of software and in the highest levels of government around the world. I like the term excitement. I think <laughs> it's very good. Term. I'll also add in that um, safety and critical infrastructure is uh, on a lot of people's minds because vulnerabilities are being attacked in there. So anything that potentially has to do with safety certification, you need to know what's there. And quite frankly, the safety standards have been calling for it for a long time for the risk analysis. So in the energy sector, in the automotive sector, any place where there's potentially safety, you need to be secure in order to be safe. Um, and so the transparency is going to be very much useful in that space. And so we have these things all sort of rising to the forefront as more and more stark was it open source and automation that we need to be looking at. You know, it's, uh, when it comes to um... Asking the question, you know, why is it time now to require uh, S bombs, both on production and consumption side? I mean, it, obviously, it feels like um, it's important from just the standpoint of the bill of materials, uh, you know, the Twinkie analogy. Um, but also, it feels to me like this idea of safety and the vulnerabilities is really a more pressing concern as we look at uh, what's going on in software today. So, so is. Is that what's driving the, the federal requirement uh, from an acquisition standpoint to, uh, to require us bombs? So Alan, I can take a stab at that first if you want. So here's the way we've started to look at this. We FDA have started to look at this. Um, I think everybody in security eventually wants to move from reactive risk management to proactive risk management. And the journey of SBOM for FDA has been very similar to that. We sort of started out reactively where following WannaCry and other incidents, we're like, we have to know where this stuff is because we have to be able to respond to it in an efficient and timely manner. I think as we've matured and we've watched the sector mature, both specifically related to SBOM and just in general, we actually want to move to a point where you, we're using SBOMs proactively because one of the biggest things that we face in healthcare is the legacy problem where we just have old stuff. We have old stuff everywhere and it's unprotectable because it can't be updated. It was never designed to be updated. It's 30 years old, but it still functions just fine. And a hospital is not going to replace a $500 million MRI like you replaced your iPhone, right? You're, that's, that's not how that works. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of challenges with legacy and what we are starting to see, and this is becoming more and more of a thing in healthcare, is putting SBOMs as procurement tools to the point that Alan was, um, was raising earlier about, don't you want to know if you're acquiring something that's known bad and, and, you know, give people the ability to have affirmative risk decisions. We're seeing a value of keeping bad stuff out of healthcare environments and unsafe stuff out of healthcare environments. 
by essentially using the SBOM as a procurement tool. So we're, we're you know, looking at uh, having manufacturers, medical device manufacturers, um, produce when when a hospital or a healthcare delivery organization is you know comparing drug pumps, uh, you know they can sit down with the the S bombs of the various drug pump manufacturers and say, okay, uh, pump A is better because it has you know less vulnerable components according to its S bomb than pump B, so we're buying pump A. And so we think there's huge value in that, and that actually starts to move us from a reactive risk management standpoint for using S bombs, which is important, um, but to, you know, proactive is better and, and proactive risk management using S bombs gives us that leg up and that ability to keep stuff out that we might not want in, in the first place. The, in terms of why we want to compel, right? So Stephen, very, very interested in sort of saying, hey, why is the government getting involved beyond just, you know, helping coordinate? Um, so taking a step back, you know, you say, hey, um, the fact that we don't have it today is because this is a complex system, uh, right? It's a, there's, it was very much a chicken and egg approach where no one was asking for this data, so no one was supplying it. No one was supplying it, so no one was asking for it. And so that means it has been harder to create uh, sort of the, the market demand for open source tools and commercial tools to sort of help create SBOMs and help consume them. And so one of the reasons the US government, I think, is getting involved is to say it's not just enough to sort of help shape this idea uh, and help the community come together and define it, uh, but we're also going to start driving the market. And so uh, it's much easier, and we want everyone to start asking for S-bombs. Uh, when I talk to large organizations that produce software, um, a lot of them are a little reluctant to sort of share their S-bombs until you sort of frame it this way. It's like, wouldn't you like the S-bomb for your software that, that you're using? And it was, oh yeah, definitely. That'd be really helpful. We could do A, B, C, D. And so the vision here is to sort of prime the pump to start saying, hey, let's get everyone in the habit of asking for this. That will further create SBOMs, which in turn will drive an ecosystem for saying, if we have this data, what could we do with it? Uh, there are so many amazing people in the open source space uh, that are creating new things. And candidly, there's an awful lot of VC money out there for security, especially for supply chain. Uh, and so we're pretty confident that as there is, as this data becomes more common and our assumptions about interoperability and scale are validated, uh, we're gonna see a lot more tools and a lot more innovation to build on this. And the, the last analogy I'll share is uh, for CVE, right? Common vulnerability enumeration. There's nothing magical about giving a vulnerability a number. Doesn't fix anything at all. It's still there, still gonna fix it. But by creating the common data plane, now we all have a similar point of reference and we can start to have common tools, common processes, uh, common services that can help us. So one, and one thing that, I don't disagree with anything that Alan just said, but I do need to clarify one thing. Um, so FDA, uh, I don't know how familiar people are with FDA guidance. But FDA guidance is exactly that. It's guidance about how industry can uh, meet FDA regulations. It's not required. Um, this is a little bit of a nuanced thing. And if you spend any time in medical devices, I can almost see your face uh, as, as I'm saying all this. But while FDA, we're not requiring SBOMs, but we are recommending in guidance that you put them in there. And we are recommending extremely strongly. So just need to clarify that one bit and and again to, to be slightly more precise thank you jessica um so what is the u.s government currently proposing uh under may uh executive order number 14028 uh that came from the white house they are going to ultimately require things that the u.s government buys have an s-bomb uh now a couple of points on that from a policy perspective the u.s government buys a lot uh, and so we think that we'll have an approach, but it is not, uh, it is going to affect two actors in the private sector in the open source world, uh, other than just saying, hey, we know that there are going to be more interest in having this data around, and it's going to have a much more uh, broader effect of having people say, oh, that seems interesting. Maybe I want one of those too. Okay, awesome. Listen, I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, you know, I just came off doing some uh, SBOM quantitative research, worldwide research. Um, 
And prior to, to landing at Linux Foundation, I was an industry analyst for 30 years. And I will tell you, and I was driving a lot of research in application development and deployment. And I never once heard the SBOM term come up in conversation with vendors. Um, and this was, was, it was an eye opener to me when I landed at the Linux Foundation. Um, so a focus of the research that I did in the SBOM space was to understand what the penetration rates were, what adoption was, and what projected adoption was going to be going forward. Uh, so let me just give you a couple of numbers there, and I'm going to ask the panelists to kind of comment on whether this surprises them or not. So uh, we have 47% of the sample um, is using SBOMs today in some capacity. Now, some capacity means they're using it uh, in a few lines of business or some or uh, many, or they have adopted it as a, as a standard across their company. Um, so it varies depending upon how much they're actually using SBOMs, but they are using them in some capacity, both on the production and on the consumption side. We have 40% of the sample is not using SBOMs today, but are planning to use SBOMs sometime in the next two years, meaning 2022 and 2023. And when we look at the timeline based on when they said they were going to be adopting SBOMs, um, we end up with 66% growth in 2022. Um, that basically increases penetration from the 47% all the way up um, to, what was it, 70, 78%, I think it was, in 2022. And then growth's going to taper off in 2023 to be at 13% because we're already at a pretty high level of adoption. And, but yet 13% uh, growth in, across 2023 ends up, I think, at 88% penetration overall, which is quite high. Um, but I think a lot of the reasons it's high because of the executive order and similar kinds of activities around the globe. So given all of this, does this come as a surprise to you uh, as a panelist? Um, or is this expected based on the work that you've been doing behind the scenes here? So um, what do you guys think? Uh, so I'm, I'm watching Alan and Kate not come off mute. So I will, <laughs> <laughs> I will take a shot. Um, this is entirely expected. I, you know, I, I can keep this answer short because at least in the medical device manufacturer realm, FDA has been saying for five years now that, you know, better get ready to be able to produce and consume S-bombs. So, you know, maybe, maybe I'm, you know, a little too rosy of a perspective, but I think the medical device manufacturers are like, yeah, we got to do this. Yeah. Um, I think the recent focus has really crystallized and got the us over that hump of adoption because there's been people who've been wanting to do it in the embedded space and have been doing it quite frankly for you know eight nine years the challenge is it hasn't hit the mainstream mind share and so um the fact that it is now starting to hit the mainstream mind share is ex tremendously exciting and it also means that people have done the work some a lot of the work beforehand so it's there to be taken advantage of too so it's nothing you know it's building up on things yeah. Ellen? Great. Ellen, do you want to comment or do you want me to move on here? Because I've got a, I've got a drill. Uh, the, 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 the last thing I'll say, uh, just sort of highlighting on the sort of the, you know, what, what's under the water is um, it, this is a model that only works if we have a pretty common global understanding of what an SBOM is, what an SBOM isn't, what, uh, you know, sort of following a certain model of crawl, then walk, then run. Uh, and building a modular architecture, making sure that, hey, there's a lot of stuff that's relevant to the SBOM and we wanna tie it to it, but maybe we shouldn't build it straight into this approach. Uh, so th th there's a lot of different moving pieces. And I think the value is making sure that we're all on the similar page. We're all using very similar software, if not the same software, further up our supply chain. And so even though our sectors are different, our technologies are different, um, the momentum has come from having a very common shared understanding. So, okay, well, given, given this really strong interest in adopting SBOMs, um, maybe we should try to talk a little bit more about what each of the following groups are gonna be doing or, or will be doing, what's on their roadmap to help ensure SBOM adoption, you know, in this year and next year. 
And I think we should look at this from the standpoint of the role of the government, the role of the vendor community, uh, what should end users be doing, and also potentially what should IT you know, industry organizations like Linux Foundation be doing. So uh, does somebody want to start? I mean, I think, uh, Jessica, you've already sort of mentioned you know, what, uh, what's going on at FDA, but from an overall government perspective, you know, what should the government's role be? Now that we've got some momentum behind us, bombs, what should the government do to help perpetuate uh, all of this momentum? So I might defer the what can the, what should the government be doing question to Alan, who sits at a little of an organization that has a little bit of that broader view. But um, for FDA, you know, the, we we're already doing it. Uh, again, for those involved in the medical device ecosystem, I know everyone is waiting with bated breath for the updated draft of the pre-market cybersecurity guidance. Um, I, it's not a secret. SBOM's going to be in there, right? Like it, it is a recommendation, an extremely strong recommendation, has been for half a decade. Um, for FDA that you produce and consume as bombs to, uh, to have better cybersecurity risk management. Um, and we're going to continue pushing that, you know, and, and FDA is going to continue in, in the forums that we're involved in and in the conversations that we have, uh, essentially saying that, you know, bottom line, we understand it's hard. We understand the tooling is still being developed. We understand the best practices are still being developed. You need as bombs. And that's, that's pretty much the, uh, the approach that we're taking. So uh, I see a couple of different roles for uh, the federal government, or the U.S. federal government. Uh, one is to help catalyze the community effort. Right? This isn't something any one party should be driving because there are different equities, right? We need to sort of understand uh, what's important for the open source world, for the commercial world, the proprietary world. Uh, what's important for the tool vendors is going to be different than what's important from the uh, you know, the, the, the users of the tools. Uh, and so trying to sort of build this model is gonna be important. Um, moving forward, we've identified a number of areas that we wanna advance uh, collectively, including how do we think about SBOM for cloud and SaaS? It's a little different than on-prem or embedded. Uh, and also how are we gonna move this data around? What's the transport model look like? Uh, because we don't really have some global ways of thinking about that, especially if we, don't, if we want access control as a layer. So, there's an example of that. So one is just catalyzing that. Two is coordinating this effort. Uh, as I mentioned, this is something that really uh, is a global effort. We've partnered with our friends in the German government and the Japanese government, as well as companies around the world, organizations around the world. And so we want to uh, make sure that this stays uh, something that, that we're, we're, is really built on collective effort. And the last thing I sort of wanna emphasize is if we're still talking about SBOM as a unique novel thing in a few years, I will have considered that a failure on, on my part because the goal is to sort of make this just part of the vulnerability ecosystem, right? This shouldn't be seen as a unique idea. This should just be seen as how we make software, how we talk about software, how we handle software, how we evaluate software. Um, and so the longer term, you know, one of the roles of government is to make sure that this is integrated into all those other parts of the vulnerability ecosystem that are happening around the world. And I'll say it extends beyond the vulnerability ecosystem too. It should just be how we make software, period. <laughs> um, from the standpoint of the vendor community and service providers, is there something, is there something that needs to go on there to, uh, to help be able to satisfy all of the growth that, that's gonna, that is projected to, to happen this year? Does anybody want to take a swing at you know what the vendor and service provider community should be should be thinking about? Um, I mean, I think so. The vendor and you know um, having commercial offerings out there and having consultants out there that people can work with for doing the analysis is going to be key for adoption. Um, some people will want to do things and roll their own and work with open source tools and everything else. But there's a lot of other people that just say, okay, I just want to hit the button and it, it show up. I really don't want to have to think about this hard. I'm willing to pay you some money to help me. And that makes a market opportunity for people to basically create new uh, innovative business models as well as helping the, advance the transparency at the end of the day. Um, so having the um, capabilities there and being able to work with the open source communities who are trying to do this as well as help reinforce common understanding of what the semantics of the fields mean. Um, these are things that I think we all can be working on with vendors as well as open source 
to really make it move forward because yeah. there's lots of different systems out there. There's like, you know, there's lots of different vulnerability systems out there, right? And being able to link into all these different vulnerability systems is kind of key as well. Yeah, and I'll say for what well, one thing that we've been very cognizant of um, is for smaller manufacturers and for uh, FDA doesn't regulate hospitals, but for the hospitals who we expect to be receiving this information, we have heard concerns that they're like, look, we're already flooded with vulnerability data. We're already flooded with all kinds of information that we have no idea what to do with. And now you want to dump all of this additional information on it. Like we, we don't, we have no idea what we're supposed to do with this. And so I will, I would say that the, the vendor tool community is actually going to be critical in uh, actually operationalizing a lot of these things. Because you have organizations who are just like, unless to Kate's point, they get the like press the button service, then handing them a bunch of S bombs doesn't do them any good and we don't go anywhere. So um, I expect the, the tool community to be a uh, very critical part of this. And so sort of building on that point, there's two things to flag. One, just on the downstream users offer completely. There, there's always going to be a maturity model in all of security. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't work on advancing it. We know that most things in security sort of follow a, uh, a trickle down path of starts off with very elite organizations, hiring world-class experts, rolling their own tools and solutions, and then we sort of fit it into turnkey. You know, the example here is threat intelligence. Uh, no one says, hey, because your small organization can't handle threat intelligence, they're still doing, you know, the basics, doesn't mean that we shouldn't build out new threat intel tools uh, or SecOps tools for development. Um, the other thing to flag and something that's uh, really a concern for a lot of us inside the U.S. government is we're always worried about things that put small businesses at a disadvantage, right? We know that a lot of innovation comes from smaller uh, organizations. We don't want to give them these large, heavy regulations that were sort of really motivated and had input from giant tech companies or giant contractors, but didn't really have the small business in mind. The great thing about SBOM, I think, is for especially people who are developing software, this is often, if not usually, much easier and cheaper for smaller organizations, um, right? If you have a modern development tool and a modern development pipeline, there are tools out there that can spit out SBOMs in whichever data format you want uh, and can, right, can be integrated into this. This is something that is, is beneficial if you have a modern thing. It actually is harder if you're a legacy with legacy stovepipe pipelines. Okay, um, one thing I'll just add about the vendor community, um, the research that I just uh, I just did on, on SBOMs shows that from a kind of a best practices standpoint, end user organizations are, are really trying to understand which vendors are gonna be providing SBOM tools out there and one of these tools gonna to be available. So I, I think one of the things that communicates is that the vendor community needs to take a more proactive and visible stance in terms of driving up the visibility around what they're doing with SBOMs and also uh, putting putting more into messaging from the standpoint of, of communicating to end users what their capabilities really are here. Um, so let's um, let's talk briefly about SBOMs and this uh, this whole issue of existing and emergent component vulnerabilities. Um, I mean, the first question is, I mean, I, I know that SBOMs uh, don't contain information about vulnerabilities, but they do attempt potentially link um, to known existing and uh, emerging vulnerabilities. So one of the things I, I guess, let's just clarify, you know, what is the stance? What do SBOMs do today and potentially tomorrow if they don't do it today? What's the relationship between SBOMs and known vulnerabilities? Where are we with that? Um, at this point in time. Sure, so um, I'll, I'll kick us off and then I'll, I think Alan's probably gonna end up talking about VEX and I will try to make uh, as few faces as possible while that conversation is ongoing. Um, so, you know, SBOMS and vulnerability management uh, is, a, is a complicated marriage because, right, we've been saying all along, we, one of the major use cases for SBOMS is vulnerability management. Um, and I, we, we have heard the concern raised uh, in the past and, and still now that 
Look, if we give people in SBOM, they're going to go to the CVE database, or they're going to go to another vulnerability database, and they're going to look up, uh, well, here's all these components, and here's all these vulnerabilities, and now I'm going to go back to the vendor, and the vendor must fix all these vulnerabilities, and uh, the vendor might be like, well, yeah, the, the vulnerabilities are there, and the components are vulnerable, but like, you don't need to worry about it because compensating controls or you know whatever else it is that they're going to... Um, whatever else it is that they're gonna argue. And look, I'm being extremely dismissive of it, and I'll admit that, because this is, this is something that I find extremely personally frustrating. Um, Log4j, not vulnerable until it was, right? And we've seen that all the time, where there's, you have a vulnerability, uh, so it, it's vulnerable, but it's really complicated to exploit, except until somebody puts up the new POC that makes it really easy, or until you start chaining them together with a bunch of other vulnerabilities that means that suddenly that's extremely exploitable and a huge problem. So I will say from the FDA perspective, we have not necessarily been that receptive and in fact have pushed back very strongly on this idea of it's okay to have vulnerable components and you know we'll just wrap compensating controls and other things around them and somehow that completely mitigates the rest you know it's we it's going to take time and it over time we'll get better at this but having vulnerable components uh within a device is just asking for trouble and the more and more that we keep integrating software into everything that we do and into critical infrastructure that just becomes less and less and less acceptable. And I don't know why we would voluntarily do that if we have the information and we have the ability to not do it. So that, you know, that's certainly where I think I'm coming from and where FDA is coming from on sort of this, this you know, challenge between vulnerabilities and s bombs and so on. And no, I, I, go, I, ahead, I, go ahead, Ellen. Go ahead, and I'll follow on. So uh, to coin a completely original phrase, all good software is the same, all bad software is bad in uniquely different ways. Uh, and I totally understand uh, Jessica's perspective, especially because as a government regulator, she's been lying to in the past. People have said, you know, hey, th there's some great stories where people said, oh, this doesn't affect us. But they said it too soon. And, and, and we've talked to lots of downstream softwares who say, I will never trust either this specific vector or indeed any vendor if they say something. However, I think there still is a large class of ways where someone may say, um, this is not as bad as it may appear just by looking at ability and mapping a vulnerability to an SBOM. Mm -hmm. uh, now that's true for a couple reasons. One, we sort of have to acknowledge that resources are finite everywhere uh, and right, having someone implement a major fix or indeed a major feature might be more important than taking care of a low probability of vulnerability. Uh, who is the best, who is in the best position to make that risk decision is a tension between the supplier of the software, open source or commercial, uh, open source proprietary and the user. And there's gonna be different models. Obviously, if you're in a very high assurance domain, where you know you're regularly under active threat by adversaries, you're gonna have a different perspective than if you just want your stuff to work and you want it to be cheap. Um, one of the things that we're working to develop in parallel to S1 is this, forgive me, this is probably the worst named project in all of software and it's all my fault, uh, Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange or VEX. And I'll post a link in the chat for a, a one page summary of it. Uh, the vision here is it allows a software supplier, again, could be the open source project, could be a proprietary supplier to say, um, this product and this vulnerability, it is not affected by this vulnerability, even if it contains it. Now, there are many reasons it could be, and we're working on sort of building out, uh, and, and the goal is to make it machine readable. And so the vision here is to allow someone to say, yes, I'm using Heartbleed 1.0.1 because I haven't had time to refactor my code, but I'm only using the pseudo random number generator and the heartbeat function isn't even in the product, right? The compiler did not include the, the software that puts, that, that puts you at risk 
of random memory leaks from the heart bleed vulnerability. So here is how do we enable that to happen automated? And of course, no one has to trust this. This is a set of assertions. And you can say, you know what, these vendors, these suppliers totally trust. They've got great product security teams. These guys, not a chance. We're still gonna either, you know, we're still gonna treat it as if it's vulnerable. And the, the last thing I'll say is we can also, there are things that we can do to supplement this with trust. So this for me is a great example. Um, I'm not always the world's biggest fan of bug bounties, but this is a great example where a bug bounty can be very useful, where someone can assert this product, this vulnerability does not affect my product. And to support that, here's a $100,000 bounty if anyone can sort of figure out how to chain it or if anyone can figure out how to exploit it. So that allows us to sort of build out further infrastructure. Again, shouldn't these things, these things as unique? We want to talk about how they all fit together. Um, I'll build on that then, because that takes me into the embedded space. And um, actually, one of the problems we had with the Zephyr project is when FNET, well, Amnesia 33 came back out and FNET was there, um, our LTS had FNET in there. However, well, actually, the version of Zephyr never had the files that were affected at the source file level. So we had no way of signaling to people that that version of Zephyr was not affected. And so we had to put a blog post out. So having VEX and having a way of summarizing this in an automated fashion is going to be very powerful for open source projects as well as vendors. Um, and in fact, you know, some of the comments, one of the questions that sort of came in from the uh, audience here was, you know, well, this can't apply into embedded. Well, actually, yes, it can. And embedded is leading the way in certain areas right now. Um, in particular, I'll call out like the Octo project. Right now, when you're doing pro uh, builds in the Octo project, which is embedded all the way, you have the access to full reproducibility of your packages, which is one thing that helps with that long-term maintainability. And you have the ability to generate off a software bill of materials automatically. And getting this automatic building of software bill materials in the embedded space is going to be pretty much key to um, having these devices that are showing up in critical infrastructure like medical and so forth, being able to know that we've got um, a clear understanding of exactly what's in there because it's been less business. as it was built, you have the summary coming out. The Zephyr project has also added this capability in so that anytime you're doing a device that's really memory constrained, you have that ability to come out with a file that summarizes all of this information. And there's no reason this can't be scaled to everywhere else in the industry. Like I said, we've got some proof points out there now of open source projects doing the right thing automatically and making it easy for people. And I think that's where we need to go for everyone. Hey, awesome. Listen, uh, before we shift over to question and answer, let me ask one more question here, which and this comes, this is uh, based on best practices uh, that uh, end user organizations want to see in the SBOM space. Um, the, the survey data that I collected um, shows that 62% of uh, organizations are looking for best DevOps practices for both producing and consuming SBOMs. Um, number two at 58% was best OSPO, open source pro, you know, program office practices for integrating SBOMs into governance, risk, and compliance. And then, you know, understanding how SBOMs are going to evolve over time came in at 53%. And then finally, uh, knowing which vendors are going to provide SBOM tools was at 46%. So given those sort of requests for what we should be doing to support the, the user community around SBOMs, is there anything else that sort of jumps to mind that uh, you think is important um, that will help the end user community be more successful with the S with S bombs. I love watching all the tools that are coming out. Um, right, that is sort of this has been S bomb coordination and promotion. It's been my full time job now for you know, four years, uh, and and it's been fantastic to see every six months another wave of projects and of companies that have started on this. So I think. The short answer is I'm going to call back to something Kate said, which is um, we're working uh, is, is sort of building out this sort of tool model. Um, both the SPDX community and the Cyclone DX community have done a good job of sort of helping shepherd the tooling in their ecosystem. And one of the things that we want to do down the road at CISA is sort of have more transparency to that marketplace so that folks can sort of understand how to compare uh, tools and make sure that they are functionally equivalent. Uh, and so that's one of our goals. 
Okay. Um, well, listen, I think we should probably switch over to question and answer from the audience at this point. Um, so let me, uh, what I'll do is I'll be, I'll, I'll identify the question that's been asked by the audience and then we'll see, you know, who wants to, or who, who wants to, uh, and to answer the question. So the first question here um, is how should we think about applying SBOMs to development and CI CD processes? And I think to that, I'd also add maintenance. Um, so, you know, any, any uh, recommendations on how best to sort of bring SBOM tooling in um, and, you know, how to integrate that into some, what, what's happening inside of DevOps? So I think I'll start then um, putting plugins into the tooling. There's a bunch of plugin options out there that people can integrate. I'd say start with that and then see where they're lacking and quite frankly, contribute back upstream and help make these things robust and able to scale. Um, so there are there, there's, there's starting points out there. Um, the Kubernetes community, for instance, has already you know, incorporated some of this. Um, so you know, looking at that project, you know, looking at what they're doing, um, helping the, you know, that's one generation, if it's not doing exactly what you want, help contribute, make suggestions, help improve, because we need to get a whole community working together to get this to scale. Uh, following on the heels of that, we have a question, which is, I think, related, which is, will SBOM formats and content be standardized? So we've, I think, done a decent job thus far of sort of saying, what's a baseline model? This is something that the community worked on, uh, sort of having a, a initial vision in 2019, and then in 2021, uh, sort of built out uh, further, uh, here's all the different pieces that we want. Um, I'll acknowledge that there are some spaces where we're still, I think there's still some ambiguities. Uh, so for example, if we want uh, a hash of a component, pretty common part of software, um, both uh, the data formats have some advice on how to implement that. I don't think there's sort of global guidance on that. So we're still some tweaks around the edges because I think we, this is going to be something that is going to evolve. And the last thing I'll say on data formats uh, is there are two widely used today. Uh, SPDX, which is, comes out of the Linux Foundation. Kate's been a great leader on that front. Cyclone DX comes out of the OWASP world. They're both great projects. They're both open. Anyone can get involved. I encourage you, if you're interested, to, to think about them. Um, our interest is to make sure that they're interoperable uh, because we don't think that you know one is inherently going to win out over the other, and that's okay. Um, we can live in a world that has multiple data formats, uh, and I've been really pleased to see the communities uh, work together <clears throat> to make sure that they're harmonized. And so I just want to doff my cap to both the SPDX and Cyclone DX team for making progress on that front. Okay, awesome. So our next question here, which is a really interesting one, which is how do the panelists feel about the confidentiality of the SBOM? Is this a blueprint for attackers? <laughs> no, it's a blueprint for the defenders. Thank you very much. <laughs> The attackers know this stuff, guys. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what we're trying to do is give tools to the defenders to actually, you know, understand what's there. Yeah, the, the right. We know that security is a fool's game. So, uh, and we know that Jidra and reverse engineering tools are free. Anyone who wants to know what's in a piece of software can. Uh, and the. The caveat there, I will also say, is there's no need for them to necessarily be public. And we know that there are going to be different sectors where they're going to say SBOMs won't be public. One, we need to make sure that we have a way of sharing them with uh, downstream users, right? So customers are going to be asking for them. Uh, and ultimately, it is going to be up to both sectors and specific to figure out what they're willing to share publicly versus confidentiality. Um, the challenge there is, right, if you say I have this data and I'm, it's confidential, well, now we need some infrastructure to talk about how to share them. So now it's not just about moving data and making sure that's available timely in a timely fashion in the access control layer on top of that. Uh, so there are companies today that are creating their SBOMs and just sharing them publicly. Uh, you know, just a well-structured URL organization dot blah, blah, slash SBOM and making it public. But there are also going to be folks that are saying, hey, you gotta go through our vendor portal or something like that to see it. That's okay too. 
vendor portals just don't scale. Okay, next question is, can we achieve complete automation of security? No. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> we can achieve a lot of automation in security, but you know, there's always going to need to be, and, and this goes to some of the point of um, you know, a vulnerability it might be different for different people, right? If if my environment has different contextual risks than your environment, then I might make a decision, a different decision about how to respond to it than you. Um, so I, I think automation can can help and start to help prioritize and, and contextualize a lot of that information. But at the end of the day, you have to have people who are sitting there who have the ability to make the the informed risk decision about how they're going to handle it. Because the other thing that I would add to, um, you know, and, and this is critically important for, for FDA and, and uh, Kate hit on this a little bit, security isn't the only consideration, right? And I think Alan mentioned this a little bit too, right? Treating patients is why people make medical devices. They don't make medical devices so that the medical can, device can be secure. I mean, it, you, you have to make the medical device so the medical device can be secure so that it can be safe, but you're designing it to actually provide a healthcare service not or a treatment or whatever it is, not security isn't the end goal. So there are gonna be circumstances, and we do talk about this in the SBOM space and in other spaces, that sometimes you are going to be weighing the benefits uh, or the risks of some security vulnerabilities against the potential benefits of whether or not that means you continue to use that device to continue to treat patients. So, uh, you know, you have to be able to make those kinds of decisions. Okay, next question here has to do with uh, producing and consuming SPOMs. And the question is, are there security concerns with producing and consuming SPOMs? And that was something that I thought about too, which is, you know, I know the hash totals are very useful from the standpoint of being able to validate a re um, um, reproducible build, but um, how trustworthy do S bombs, how trustworthy are S bombs in light of the fact that uh, there needs to be security around the creation and consumption of S bombs? So, uh... A phenomenal question and definitely where we should be thinking about from a security perspective, but it's 2022. So we don't just talk about security, we threat model. Uh, and there is going, there are gonna be different folks that are concerned about different things. If you're worried about having a, just a vulnerability on your network, known vulnerability that someone can exploit with an automated tool, then getting the best faith, best effort SBOM uh, is going to be you know, the important thing. Um, if you're worried about someone actively subverting your supply chain, then we need to start layering in trust and integrity checks. And the good news is uh, there are some tools that are moving in that direction. Um, want to uh, compliment uh, you know, the great folks at SigStore uh, who are sort of working on making sure that we have some trust inside of here and ultimately saying, hey, in addition to my SBOM, I want artifacts about the build process, the build environment, the, who had access to it. All of these are great we want to head uh, head to is we're now getting into very domain specific and tool specific approaches that may not be acceptable to ask for um, you know your average mid-sized company that's software uh, and so the goal here long term is to think about how do we integrate all of these layers in uh, so that people who want this information know how to ask for it in a globally understood way and to sort of make sure that we can sort of follow a maturity approach where we have the basics are on things like integrity and trust and for the metadata. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in because I know we're running out of time and there's a number of questions that have come in that I wanted to sort of hit on all at once. Um, so some of the questions are essentially around, you know, if we, if we do SBOMs in this way and, and the expectation is that all of these vulnerabilities have to be fixed and all these things, well, the price of software is going to shoot up and, you know, and or companies may not be willing to disclose vulnerabilities because it could have financial ramifications on them. Look, you don't want to disclose vulnerabilities. You can roll the device and or you can roll the dice and not disclose vulnerabilities. But I can tell you, for example, in the medical device space, we one, there is an expectation or it's a, it's a strongly recommended uh, procedure for FDA they, that vulnerability disclosure in devices takes place. And that's not it though. FDA regulations require that you have a safe device. If you have a vulnerable device, you might not have a safe device. 
And if you don't have a safe device because you have a vulnerability device, you might have to recall your device. Um, and so, you know, if, if a company decides not to disclose a vulnerability and it comes out later anyway, which let's be honest, it always comes out later, um, then how much worse are the financial ramifications going to be then? How much worse is the reputational damage going to be then if it looks like a company hid a vulnerability from the public? Um, you know, that's, that's never the right answer. And so, you know, I, I understand the concern from organizations that like, look, this is going to be expensive. Um, this is, might impact our reputation because we aren't going to want to essentially disclose the fact that we're using outdated, unsupported, vulnerable software in our products um, and all these other things. But like, guys, it's 2022. We've seen, we've seen cybersecurity incidents take down gas pipelines. We've seen them uh, put patient safety at risk when hospitals are getting hit with ransomware. We've seen all these things, and 90% of the time, it's known vulnerabilities that just people have in fix or that they didn't know are in their systems because there's no transparent software development. This is not a sustainable way for us to continue as a nation approaching cybersecurity. When we are relying, we are putting people's lives on, on the line in the hands of crappy software and then essentially now trying to turn around and say it's too expensive or it's too hard to not do that. And I gotta be honest with you from, from the FDA perspective, that's not really an acceptable answer to us anymore. So. That's awesome. Ellen, do you want to add anything to that? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's a question that's in that, um, and then I'd like to just quickly touch on, which is, you know, to what detail should the SBOMs describe what's in the software package? You know, that just at the component level versus the source file level? It's a fidelity question, and it's how much automation you really want to play. If something has to be high assurance, someone's life suit there, you may want to have that full traceability down to the source file level and every hash is there and you know all your build information. Because quite frankly, you need that to do your safety analysis. So um, you need to be able to scale from just the component level, which is you know a low fidelity, but it lets you at least see the live, the land to all the way down to those source files. And you know, the Amnesia 33 example I just referred to as an example, uh, was, a, you know, was a way of clarifying that. And if we want to automate, we have to be able to do that level of scaling all the way potentially even down to the snippet level. Okay, great. Hey, here's a good question, which is um, how do we retroactively generate SBOMs for already deployed products? That is a fun question. I haven't thought uh, of that, but and, it's a great question. And well, and the, the good news is there's actually a thriving marketplace for this. Um, <clears throat> so the answer is we use binary analysis tools and source composition analysis tools. Uh, there's some great ones out there today. Uh, there are even ones that are focused on particular sectors. There are companies that are doing this explicitly for medical devices. There are a couple in the energy space and the telecom space. So um, one of our challenges is going to be to sort of figure out how do you reconcile the output of one of those tools with the output of a build tool or a source tool, um, because there are subtle differences. Uh, but in the short run, there are things that look an awful lot like SBOMs that can come out of these tools. Okay, awesome. Well, listen, we're at time here. Um, so I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Kate, Jessica, and Alan for joining me today. I'd also like to thank the audience for the great questions. And I think Marisa now has some final instructions for those of you who are listening in. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you, Kate, Alan, and Jessica for your time today. It was an incredible webinar. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Just a quick reminder, this recording is going to be posted to the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. So you can check back there for the recording. Okay, thank you everyone again so much. Have a wonderful day. Thanks everyone. Thank you all.